The agenda this week reflected on Canada's refugee sponsorship program, debated how far laws about language should go, and considered the state of sexual assault and the courts. The Week in Review begins by looking at invasive species in the Great Lakes ecosystem. If you thought that looked strange, yes. I got more strange video for you. Ready? Okay. Sheldon, let's roll this. Want to see what Asian carp look like? Uh, Holy cow. Becky, what are we seeing here? Well, what you're seeing here are silver and big head carp, probably mostly silver carp. These are one of the Asian carp species, and uh, they're being startled by the boat and probably shocked a little by the electrofishing gear there. And they le leap out of the water. That is astonishing. It what, is did, Any idea what body of water that was we were looking at there? Um, no, I don't know, but I'm going to guess it's sort of along the Mississippi River Basin somewhere. Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. So in the States, probably? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. It would be Canadian waters. We're Could not that bad yet. Well, we're not even close to that yet, okay. which is great news. We do see things like that video, and um, but it really makes us not want to see these in Canada. Have you found any of these in Canadian waters yet? We have found a species of Asian carp in Canadian waters, grass carp. Um, we have a program with Fisheries and Oceans Canada since 2012 where we are being very proactive with invasive species. Lessons learned from things like Phragmites and sea lamprey that have become established. Mm -hmm. The idea with the Asian carp program is to be much more proactive and focus on preventing their arrival in the first place. Mm -hmm. As Jana said, it's really tough to deal with an invasive species once it's well established in the right. system. So the goal is to actively seek out potential Asian carp in our, in our waters and get them out immediately. Sheldon, can you roll that video one more time? Because I want you to talk about whether or not you've had any up close and personal experience <laughs> with these things. Uh, well, look I, at this. Yes. So I have. Um, actually, so Dr. Mandrak and I were invited down as part of an international contingency to uh, Peoria, Illinois, and we were brought on board a boat to, sh to see firsthand. And before that, we had seen this on video. And you watch it, and it's pretty incredible. Mm. But to be on the boat, for those fish coming at my head, and thanks to Nick, he actually punched one out of the air before it hit me in the head. Nick, you're so a hero. <laughs> I will be forever grateful. Um, but he didn't get the one that uh, hit me in the shin. And it was, it, uh, all I can say is extremely unpleasant. Um, and my leg was sore for days. So you're Just on from a, the impact? Just oh. from the impact of the, that fish. You're on a moving boat. Um, going at a, at a good speed, the fish is you know, 15 pound fish and it hits you. Um, it's very unpleasant and, and you can imagine, peop and what we could imagine is if this was Canadian waters, how would this impact um, boating, angling, water skiing, kayaking, canoeing? And, Not to mention other wildlife in the water. And, uh, exactly. So it was, uh, it was a great field trip in the sense that it really spurred both of us, I think, to say we don't want these in Canada. Right. Um, how, how big can they get? They can get to be about uh, 40 kilograms. The average size in the U.S. is, is probably about 10 kilograms. But these are massive fishes, and, and the one thing is they grow very quickly. So within their first year of life... Look at the size. How big are those? Uh, those are about uh, 20 kilograms. Okay, for, for imperial people. What, is, <laughs> what does that mean? About 40 pounds. 40 pounds, okay. Yes. And those are, those are grass carp. And uh, so the silver carp, uh, big, uh, big head carp, and grass carp all grow to that size. When did you guys find out when the Asian carp first arrived in North America? It uh, arrived in the 1960s as the result of bringing uh, the various species over uh, to help out in aquaculture industries in the U.S. and not to be raised as a food fish, but rather to control pests that were in, say, the channel catfish uh, aquaculture industry. So the interesting thing about the species, they, they have very specific uh, prey items. So the uh, grass carp obviously feeds on, on wetland plants. Uh, the silver carp feeds on microscopic plants like algae. And the big head carp feeds on, uh, feeds on microscopic animals. Uh, the black carp, a fourth species that we really haven't talked about yet and is, is not as far up the Mississippi as the other three species, is a snail eater. So it was brought in to control snails in aquaculture facilities in the U.S. So we actually introduced these species to our water systems. We brought them over deliberately. We put them in contained facilities that once they were flooded over, uh, the fishes were released into the wild. Hmm. That seems, in hindsight, like a really dumb thing to have done. Yes, and we've done it many times, and we have yet to learn our lesson. Hmm. How many fertile ones does it take to populate a lake, in your view, Becky? 
Well, we've done some modeling uh, looking at the biological and ecological characteristics of big head and silver carp. And the work suggests that it would take as many as 10 individuals, 10 females, and a similar number of males to be in one area at one time to have a greater than 50% uh, chance at establishing a population. So a lot fewer than one would think. Right. And unfortunately, the biology of these Asian carp species, uh, they're very similar to salmon in that they like to run up a river. So the um, queue would allow for any Asian carp in the area to meet up at a river. So uh, not good news, but the idea is then to make sure we don't get that many in right. the first place. And I can't remember if some one of you addressed this, but is there a natural predator of this species out there? Uh, there, there isn't. Uh, the issue with these Asian carps is that they grow quite quickly. So they'll grow to about a foot long in their first year of life, which means they quickly outgrow the, the mouth size of any potential predator. You know, we get a lot of questions here all the time from members of the public. Mm -hmm. Some of the basic nuts and bolts of this thing. Uh, Janet, let me go to you first on this. Once a refugee is approved, to come to Canada, who pays for the costs of resettling them here? Travel well, expenses, the, let's start with that. Yes, well, the, the um, cost of the uh, medical exam that they need to do to satisfy uh, Canada that their health is okay, as well as their transportation to Canada, is, uh, has to be paid for by the refugee. And of course, they don't generally have the money to pay for it up front, so what they do is they sign an agreement uh, often not really knowing what they're doing, but uh, before they are, uh, leave, to say that they will uh, pay the government back after they arrive. And so um, shortly after they arrive, they uh, receive something in the mail saying uh, that this is how much you need to pay uh, the government back uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, it's uh, a, a limit of $10,000 uh, per family. Uh, but it's uh, a huge burden uh, for people who start off um, and we heard about you know, some of the situations of people who are in very vulnerable situations. Uh, you can barely survive. You're getting a minimum uh, amount of income, uh, social assistance uh, rates, or maybe you've got a minimum wage job, and yet you've got to be paying this monthly, um, uh, this, uh, monthly payment to the government, uh, which is the repayment plus interest uh, for the transportation hmm. costs. How often so that, are those? That's a, that's a big, uh, it has a yeah. big impact on right. people psychologically and, and just in their choices of how they, they try to survive. Uh, we should add that the transportation costs and the medical exam costs for Syrian refugees have been waived by the government. Uh, for, so for some of them. There are some Syrians that have not had it covered. Depends from which jurisdiction. But yeah. the point is, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm fully in favor on, you know, recovery of fees and user fees. But for ref, and, and you know, we do that in citizenship. We charge a fee for uh, when you want to become a citizen. The fee is quite high in the meantime mm -hmm. because it's full cost recovery. Maybe that's the way it should be. Uh, but for refugees, I, I cannot understand uh, that we are being compassionate on the one hand and being transactional on the other. Uh, I, I find those two uh, sort of uh, ideas contradictory. I would prefer us to be fully generous to refugees. So waive that fee entirely. Waive that fee. Leave it up to them once they've settled um, and ask them, when do you think you are ready to give back something? Mm -hmm. I know, I mean, and, and we all know here how difficult it is for refugees mm -hmm. to find work, to integrate into the community, to have this, uh, these, this threat of repayment hanging over your head. And, and in many jurisdictions, for many countries, having a loan and being indebted is, is, is a, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to cope with. So I would say, let's find money elsewhere, maybe elsewhere even in the immigration system. There are immigrants who can afford to pay for what they get, but let's, let's be fully compassionate for refugees. Jenna, what happens if they can't pay the money back? Well, they um, will often be harassed by uh, collection uh, officers who, who try to get the money off them. Uh, eventually, um, in, in some cases, of course, it's uh, declared non-payable. Uh, but it also has impacts, for example, if you want to sponsor another family member and you haven't finished, uh, uh, you're behind on your uh, payments there, you won't be able to do that. Um, so it can have uh, consequences for people if they don't manage to, to pay up. Hmm. Should, Ellen, should we have a blanket waiving of any fees for refugees coming to this country? 
certainly I think the medical and the transportation fees should be waived. It's just so counterproductive. You know, they're working so hard to settle and, you know, we have a settlement, we have settlement agencies to help people integrate. It makes no sense to arrive here with, and, with a bill. And if, if, if it becomes a real sort of uh, stumbling block, uh, maybe we ask private sponsors. To pick up that To fee. pick up some, you know, and I certainly know from the many private sponsors I hang out with, uh, that they are, uh, that they would be open to doing that. Not they're, all, but they're, some. I was going to say, they're already picking up a lot of fees, right? I mean, renting apartments and yeah. other settlement-oriented yeah. costs. You and you see they, me smiling. I see you smiling, but you think they'd be up for 10000 more in costs in uh, health it, and travel expenses? I think it depends. Yeah. I think it depends. It's not, not a bad idea to ask. <laughs> you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. That's what they well, say. Some of the private sponsors already do, do yes. pay that because it's so terrible for them to watch uh, yeah. their the people they're sponsoring right. uh, hmm. break down on the burden of this. Uh, but uh, it's also, we need to remember the government assisted refugees that don't have a private sponsor. So right. often they are among uh, the most vulnerable. So it, it is particularly harsh for them to be facing that burden. Should mention that the government has already committed to pay the uh, medicals starting next April, um, the medical exams, but that's the smaller part of the, the, uh, the amount of money that people have to pay, so it's not a, a major solution. Gotcha. Discrimination, the Human Rights Code says, happens when a person experiences negative treatment or impact, intentional or not, because of their gender identity or gender expression. It can be direct and obvious, or subtle and hidden, but harmful just the same. It can also happen on a bigger systemic level, such as organizational rules or policies that look neutral but end up excluding trans people. Organizations are liable for any discrimination and harassment that happens. They are also liable for not accommodating a trans person's needs unless it would cause undue hardship. And again, Kyle, I'll get you to follow up on that in as much as if a trans person uh, or somebody whose gender identity was more, shall we say, complicated than the male-female that we've been talking about so far, and the pronoun used to describe that person were not traditional, would the person have a case before the Human Rights Commission? So we haven't seen cases on that at this point, but I would say absolutely as a rule of, uh, as a general rule that you should be thinking about in terms of employment settings, uh, absolutely respecting uh, trans persons, pronoun choice is really fundamental. Um, and I can also say that in lots of circumstances, uh, a pronoun may not even be required. There are lots of creative ways uh, to avoid using uh, gender pronouns at all. And so I think that, um, but when you actually look at, at the, the cases that are coming before tribunals, uh, we're not seeing that to be really the primary issue. It's much more uh, basic human rights questions, which is what the federal legislation here, Bill C-16, tries to accomplish. All right, I think we've set the table now. You want to get in on this now, I can tell. You've heard what the professor has to say. What's your response? Well, I don't understand what the claim that there's no such thing as biological sex means. And I certainly think it's let's call it an error to suggest that there's some si sort of scientific consensus about that. I mean, there's, there's biological differences between males and females in animals and human beings at every level of analysis well, from what, them. Okay, I'm jumping in here, yeah. because what, what about the notion he put forward at the end there, that if you do not refer to people with the pronoun that they prefer to be referred to, that is a form, according to the Human Rights Commission, of discrimination. It's not just a form of discrimination, it's a form of hate speech. That's why I made the video. I said that we were in danger of, of placing uh, the refusal to use certain kinds of language into the same category as Holocaust denial, and suggested that maybe that wasn't such a good idea, especially since there's plenty of debate to be had about gender issues in our society, which I also think are also in danger of becoming illegal, and quite rapidly. So. It isn't clear to me how long we'll be able to have the talk that we're having right now. Here are can some. Can I jump in there? Can I? Can I jump in? Can I jump in there on? Please. The, like, I think that's a common misconception about Bill C-16 that it's somehow going to make um, pronoun use into hate speech. If you actually look at the provisions, we're talking about very minor amendments to the criminal code. Um, for They're example, not minor. Section, they uh, put it into the hate speech category. They're not minor at all. That's I a misstatement. Agree with you on that point. I think so. Don't tell me they're minor. Here. That's not. That's not there's right. There's a lot of opportunity. So, section. Opening. 
Can yeah, I'll so go section ahead. 318, pardon me, uh, so section 318 sets out uh, a series of identifiable groups, and we're talking about the clearest of, of cases, the cases of uh, advocating genocide. Uh, and we have a series of groups that are already identified in the code, and all this does is add gender identity and gender expression to the categories that are already identified. And so I think we really have to add some um, reasonableness to this discussion, actually clearly articulate what the provision does. Well, let me be a little clear about what some of the problems, um, what you might be asking for if you want to do this. For example, and uh, Sheldon, bottom of page three here, let's put this graphic up. Pronoun misuse may become actionable through the human rights tribunals and the courts, and the remedies, monetary damages, non-financial remedies, for example, ceasing the discriminatory practice or reinstatement to the job, and public interest remedies, for example, changing hiring practices or developing non-discriminatory policies and procedures, jail time is not one of them. Jordan, you're not going to go to jail if you keep this up. Are you, do you find that uh, reassuring? What if I don't pay the fine? Then what? Then what? And let, let's talk about the legalities for a minute. As you know, the University of Toronto sent me two warning letters, right? And the second one basically asked me to stop talking about this. Who and, sent the letters? Uh, the first, it's the administration, fundamentally, the higher up people in the administration. The last one was the dean of, of uh, the Faculty of Arts and Science. Um, but, you know, it's, it's coming from the top end of the university. And the letters said, essentially, you, you must call people by the pronouns they want? They, the letters basically said that, um, and this is paraphrasing, obviously, mm -hmm. that as I'm required to abide by the university policies and the Ontario Human Rights Code, and, and it, there's a strong implication in the letter by having this discussion that I wasn't doing so, and so they're asking me to stop. And I can tell you also why they're asking me to stop apart from that. The, the codes as written, make the university just as liable for my speech as I am. So not, not only is there a reasonable possibility that what I'm doing is uttering hate speech now under our law, but the university is um, legally responsible for that. And so I think they consulted with their lawyers and decided that maybe the claim that I was making in my video was correct. That so, and so I don't regard that as trivial, and I think that the, the lawyer who's discussing this is downplaying the significance of it tremendously. Could I speak to the campus climate about this? Because I don't, uh, I don't agree with why Dr. Peterson has been asked to stop abusing students on campus. To stop doing what? Abusing students. I see. And other members of our learning community who do deserve respect and do deserve to be able to work and learn and contribute to society in a place where if they are physically assaulted, if they are um, the assault so far came from the social justice warriors who were at this free speech rally, and almost two million people have this watched not those accurate. so far. This is not accurate. Well, you can look you at the videos yourself. Because people have been making complaints about your behavior. Yes, I understand that. Yes. That, and so we're can seeing I just be a greater on opportunity here, for social justice happening Nick, that many be, people won't understand. Nick, can I be clear on something? You, you've accused him of abusing students by not using the pronouns they want to be addressed That's by. That's how I see it, absolutely. That is tantamount to abuse in your view. Absolutely. Many, many global documents, many how organizations. About violence? Is it tantamount to violence? Yes. How absolutely. about hate speech? Is it tantamount to hate yes, speech? Yes, of course. It's hate speech Fine, to tell someone that you won't refer to them as a, in a way that they, uh, that recognizes their humanity and dignity. Mary, let me get you in on this at this point. Sure. Um, <laughs> you got something you want to say, or can I, can I put a question to you? Um, both. Go ahead. Okay. Put, put the question in. You're all. a writer, Mary. I am. I know you care about free speech because you're a writer. Yes. Does, does Jordan Peterson have a little place in your heart because he's arguing free speech here? I think the interesting thing about, about, Jordan and how I feel about his video and and Jordan I actually had an opportunity to talk at length before I wrote the walrus article um, And he sails really close to things that I think people can relate to and I think that we all want to have You know an open discourse. We want conversations to unfold We want people to feel like they ha if they have something to say if they have a question They can ask it that they're not going to be censored but he sails really close and then right past it, and that's where, where he and I part ways. Because what I don't really understand is, uh, when you listen to, to, to the video, he piles a lot of things into the basket of using the pronouns that people want. And it seems to me, and you can, you can correct me uh, if I'm wrong, um, but one of his anxieties, and he talks about being fearful and, and anxious in, in his video, um, that somehow, there's a cabal of trans activists who have so much power that they are going to basically, you know, using, using the pronouns that people want and capitulating to these demands 
sort of pulls out the Jenga, you know, the critical Jenga piece of the Western canon, right? I mean, basically, Jordan is arguing that this is going to create chaos and anarchy, and that it's that it's essentially a Marxist plot um, uh, that um, is there to sow violence and there to sow confusion um, and topple any kind of hierarchy. Did, to hear Brees uh, talk, you'd think the status quo is fine and everything's hunky-dory. Uh, you know, they're the occasional bad actors, but that's the only problem we have. Actually, we have a much bigger problem than that. If you think of this in terms of service delivery, and you, you listen to Marie's accurate statistics about under-reporting and under-participation, we are profoundly failing to serve the victim community with the criminal justice system. And my uh, response to that thesis, we've been tinkering with it for years, getting rid of questions about prior sexual conduct and so on, and the reporting rates haven't changed. I say, after 30 years of, of reform in a tinkering fashion to the criminal justice system, we need to think uh, more bigly, if I can use and that word. And the reporting word. rates haven't changed because people still assume that they're going to be put through the meat grinder when they come to court. Exactly right. And, and uh, we're, we're still uh, creating a process that is traumatic for victims. So I think we need to, without uh, ab abandoning fundamental uh, precepts like the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, we need to recreate a courtroom that is more sensitive. But we also need to think about whether in some cases there are alternative methods that don't involve the criminal justice system. And people may criticize me, me for saying, well, you're, you're treating sexual assault less seriously. I say no. Mm -hmm. If we listen to the voices of victims and give them a healing journey and validation in alternative methods that work for them, then we are actually treating sexual assault more seriously. I do want to pursue that, but I feel I need to give you an opportunity because I don't think you ever said you're defending the status quo, no. but you, so you want to take them on on that? Well, I, I think there's a lot of things we have to ask ourselves about mm -hmm. sexual violence and why it's not being reported at the level of some other crime. Um, first of all is, what are the barriers to people coming forward? There are lots of steps in the process before it ever ends up in a trial. In fact, there are lots of criminal matters that resolve without any trial at all. So are, are the barriers at the reporting stage, sort of at the, the interface with complainants and the police? Is the barrier the interface with the justice system? Is the barrier the trial itself? You want to give an example of this? Well, I don't think we know why it is complainants are deciding not to come forward. Is it that they don't feel they're being listened to by the police and that the interview process with the police is not sufficiently compassionate and understanding? Well, we could come to some pretty good surmising about why people don't come forward, can't we? I don't think we can. I don't mm -hmm. think we can say it's the process of cross-examination two years down the line that's the, what the barrier is to people coming forward. I, think, I don't think we have a good understanding of that. And I, I'm not sure we have a good understanding of how many people who have been the victim of sexual violence want to come forward and are not doing that. That's an important question. People get victimized in all sorts of different ways. It's not right. It shouldn't happen. We should, we should actually be focusing, in my view, our attention on preventing sexual violence in the first sure, place. Sure. But people get victimized in lots of different ways. And they choose to come forward or not for lots of personal reasons. Wonderful and I think what that. we need to know is, why are people choosing not to come forward? Are there systemic problems within the justice system that stop people from coming forward? What are they? And I agree, if, the, if there are problems, we have to address them to the extent that we can without compromising an accused person's fundamental rights. Okay. Good questions. You want to try answering some of them? <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. um, I think uh, women do not come forward because they're not treated with respect. Uh, when they do come forward on sexual issues. Not treated by respect by whom? Uh, throughout. Uh, throughout. Police, courts, media. Yeah, well, there might public. be in general, in yes. General. Uh, and cross examination is brutal. It is mm -hmm. absolutely brutal. Uh, it can be humiliating. And I do not believe that judges are sufficiently interfering and controlling with it because uh, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada has said cross examination is one of the best techniques to ascertain truth. I simply do not agree with that. And 
women do not wish to come forward and have all kinds of aspects of themselves scrutinized in perhaps a bullying and uh, brutal way. Second, it's an adversary system. It's one against the other. Uh, when really it's a, a tripart kind of thing. It's society, the interests of society, it's the interest of victims, and it's the interest of the accused. And quite often, I think that Crown attorneys are not active enough in containing bullying, cross-examination. Uh, witnesses can be cross-examined on minutia of something that might be, a, be allowed when perhaps a simple statement of agreement, yes, I did say that earlier, or that sort of thing. And cross-examination on inconsistencies gets to be grotesque on every little thing. Oh, you were wearing pink pajamas, not blue. And then at the end, every little discrepancy is, is like a dartboard that somehow you have attacked this person. Who wants to, to go forward and do that? You know, if I had a, if I pulled a gun on you right now, and I certainly wouldn't. Please don't. I, I'm exactly. I thought. You should have checked to see if, <laughs> exactly, you if were I packing had a weapon. Before. Yes, exactly. But your brain would, you would focus on my weapon, and that your whole perceptual field would would narrow, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't be encoding any other information. You would be encoding just the central details. So other stuff could be going on in here, and I wouldn't know anything you would about not, it. Yeah, exactly. I'm just, and most people are asked questions about what was going on around you. And that explains why they don't know. Exactly. In which case, why, particularly in settings around the justice system, courts, interviews with the Crown, with police, and so on, why do we expect people, why do we apparently expect people who have been through this kind of trauma to behave completely rationally and respond, you know, in, in the way that one would require in a court? I think it's because a lot of people haven't understood the, the neurobiology of these experiences. So what happens when the brain's flooded, part of the brain becomes deactivated including the prefrontal cortex, which is our rational, executive, thinking part of the brain. Because that's not necessary for survival. Survival, you want to go into a more primitive state of just focusing on the central details, trying to get through it. So I think, I mean, after a car accident, we don't expect someone to be able to tell a story, mm -hmm. right? So there's a sense that people are, I think there's an assumption that it's not um, terrifying. Maybe it's the there's an assumption still that a sexual assault isn't something that creates a lot of fear or threat for someone. Mm -hmm. And then minimizing those responses. Because generally, when I've, I have lots of sexual assault victims that come to my private practice, most of them cannot tell me the story. It takes a long time to create that narrative. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have that. And they certainly, during the middle of the assault, they're not strategizing or thinking through. So I was an expert in the court in one case where a woman was quite terrified of a man who'd been sexually assaulting her. And he was locked out one night. He was, he was quite drunk and he was pounding on the door saying, let me in. And she stood on the other side of the door and then she opened it. And so during court, the defense is saying, well, if you were so afraid of him, Why'd you let why him did in? you open him? And she said, I don't know. And that's, that's a pretty typical response. It wasn't she was in a rational thinking of, and they said, why don't you just go to the phone and call 911? That wasn't available to her. She just thought, if I don't, I'm gonna be in worse danger. And, and part of her brain would have been disconnected and she wasn't thinking. Unfortunately, no one says, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? And when I'm an expert in court, they just give me a transcript that says, what did you do next? What did you do next? But if someone said, why you were standing outside that door, do you remember what you were feeling in your body? Do you remember what thoughts were going through your head? Then you have really important evidence. She might say, I felt frozen, or I don't remember feeling anything. That's evidence. Mm -hmm. That means someone's dissociative or you know, shut down. Or if she said, all I could think of, do what you need to do to survive. Again, that's really important information. Hmm. But those things get missed. Right? What do you think it says about the justice system that for some reason, if the trauma of a car accident on the one hand and the trauma of a, an attempted rape on the other hand, we seem to have lots of understanding for why the mind might shut down and not realize right. various facts for the car accident, but somehow the justice system doesn't seem to appreciate the same could be true in an attempted rape. Exactly. And I, I, I don't want to generalize too much, but I still think there's a, an attitude that rape is just sex. Not that rape is in a, in a horrifying, threatening experience for people who are victims of it, and, hmm. and especially if it's relational. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety if you like. They're all on our website, tvo.org. 
on our iTunes channel and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.